Hi, everybody. Welcome to What is OpenSearch? This session is going to provide an overview of the OpenSearch project um, and what its components are. Uh, it should serve as uh, kind of a basis for your knowledge for other OpenSearch sessions. There's quite a few at this conference. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and dive right in and talk about uh, what we'll be going over. So first, uh, we have to talk about the project in general. And, and I've given you a little bit of a hint of that, but I'm going to go and uh, let you uh, have all the details that you'll need to understand its structure. Then we'll talk about the architecture of the software uh, and the plugins that uh, are contained in the software um, that make up a lot of the functionality. Then we're going to talk about um, installation, basic usage, and interaction with the software. Uh, this will involve a little bit of demoing um, and kind of give you some ideas of where we're at right now. Uh, then I'll go over how you can uh, contribute and get involved um, with the OpenSearch project. So first, maybe you want to know a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Kyle Davis. Um, I am uh, here on the screen here, and I know you can see me in the playback. I've been putting this picture up uh, quite a bit because, uh, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic still, and uh, it, it, I got the bad news that my barber has decided to go out of business. Um, I, I haven't been frequenting our, my barber very much, and I've been giving myself home haircuts. Um, I'm a person that is actually a little vain and takes uh, quite a lot of pride in my personal grooming, uh, and during the pandemic, that hasn't been going as I might expect. Uh, so if you do see me in public, which I hope we do meet in public uh, in the upcoming months, uh, I'm going to look a lot more like this. Don't pay attention to uh, you know my pseudo model that I've got going on. So um, yeah, I'll look a lot more like my picture here on the screen. My job is being a senior developer advocate for the Open Search Project at AWS. Now, uh, I was hired for a little bit of a, a different project, and it kind of evolved. Um, I was hired at a super exciting time, um, but uh, I'll talk more about that in one of the subsequent slides. Um, but I, I want you to know a little bit about me. The way I generally present this is in a series of numbers. Um, if you watch many of my other presentations, you'll probably see this here the same spiel, so you'll, you'll be able to uh, uh, rattle back my own biography to me. Uh, let's start with the first number, 92, and, and that really represents 1992. That was the year in which I started seriously working on software. Um, I was young, and uh, I had maybe a little bit of a, a weird perspective on what was fun, and I thought building a compiler was the most interesting thing in the world, and I went to my local library and checked out all the books on this, and, um, you know, I, I built a compiler when I was um, very young. And I, I released it as shareware. And shareware is probably a term that you don't hear very often. And maybe some of the younger folks in the crowd have never heard this term. Um, and uh, it was really, it was really fun. I released it onto a bulletin board system of EBS back in the day. Um, and it was, it was the first time I got attention um, writing software. I wrote the software, threw it out there, and like immediately, I put my phone number in it. Uh, immediately, I got a phone call uh, from someone saying, "Oh, I want to use this, and we should work on something." He didn't know that I was was so young. Um, and uh, so it was a lot of fun. Um, I would love to find it someday. I'll probably cringe at what it uh, looks like and the errors that I made. Uh, but that's kind of where the origin it was. And, and ever since 1992, it's been part of my life. So the majority of my life and, and for, for decades now, um, I've been interested in software and what software can do. Um, so that brings me to my role here. I've been at Amazon for 241 or 242, depending on what data conference you're seeing this on, um, uh, days. So at relatively young, I, I, like I said, I was uh, hired to work on a different project, but I came in at a super exciting time. Um, so I was hired to work on the Open Distro for Elasticsearch project, which is related, but uh, different. And uh, just a, a, a few months into my uh, tenure here, um, you know, I, I got a really great experience on, on um, a really high profile project, and that's open search. Uh, three represents the number of search engines I've worked with. Um, search is a really uh, interesting domain for me. Um, I keep on coming back to it. Uh, I, I, I think it's great because it really democratizes data. You, you, if you look me up and, and hear about this, you'll probably see some of the Redis based stuff that I've done for search engines. Um, um, but now I'm working with open search, and it's really great to be in such an um, important project. So uh, 53 represents the 53rd parallel. Uh, that is the uh, 
um, place where Edmonton, Alberta is, where I live, um, which is quite far north. It's um, the northernmost city in Canada. Um, and uh, it's a little unique. There's not a whole lot of people in tech up here, um, but it's, uh, it's a great place um, and it's a big part of me. Uh, and eight, eight is uh, the weight of my dog in pounds. So you may hear a dog bark in the background. If you're lucky, I, I, I can't predict this. He may jump into my lap. Uh, his name is Mr. Button. He's an eight pound Italian greyhound. Uh, and if you follow me on social media, I have three basic topics that I, I go over. 3D printing, uh, search engines, and my dog. So uh, you'll get to know me. So let's go ahead and dive right into the project itself. Um, the project is something that uh, is more than just one single piece of software, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it, it, uh, the Open Search project represents a, a lot of people um, putting their time into this um, and uh, hopefully producing something that's really great for um, you know, all software. Uh, it has such wide uses and implications that um, you know, those who are involved think they can really make a difference um, in how we run our software and how we um, you know, uh, can find data. So it's a really far-reaching project. Let's dive first into the definition. So the definition of, of open search is, and, and I'll read this verbatim, but don't often do this, but I think the words are important here. Uh, open search is a community-driven open ser source search and analytics suite derived from the Apache 2.0 licensed Elasticsearch 7.10.2 and Kibana 7.10.2. So let's break this down a little bit. Um, so uh, community-driven, that's a really important part of our project. Um, uh, we're doing this in a way that we don't have, um, you know, a, a secret roadmap. Uh, we have, um, we're trying to be re as responsive as we can to the community um, and, and uh, taking those um, the piece of feedback really important and, and uh, really that really important feedback really to heart and making sure that uh, you know the entire community gets a voice here and if something is important to the community um, as far as like the features and the, the software um, that's the direction we want to go um, so it's a search analytics suite we'll get into this a little bit more um, Suite is an important word here um, in that it's it's more than one piece of software. It kind of there are a bunch of pieces of software that all work together. Uh, it's good for both search and analytical workloads. Um, and it's derived from Elasticsearch and Kibana. Um, these are forks, and we'll get into that in just a, a minute and, and how it's growing into its own project. Uh, it consists of uh, a search engine daemon. So this is something that works in the background, and that's called open search. And then a visualization and user interface called open search dashboards as well as a series of functionality um, um, adding tools and plugins so these are the things that take that that kind of kernel of open search and open search dashboards and, and add a lot of really useful features that round out the experience for for users so the history of the project is this in the beginning <laughs> there was the open search excuse me open source elastic search and kibana um, by different organizations, the whole thing. Um, it existed, and um, one of the things that happened about 2019 was um, the uh, release of Open Distro for Elasticsearch. And you can see its logo in the bottom of your screen here. Uh, basically, what that was was taking open source software and adding um, extensions to it um, that, that made it do more. Um, you can think of this as kind of like Linux and then all the other software that you pile on top of Linux to make it useful, and then you'd have you know, various different types of distributions of Ubuntu and Red Hat and so on and so forth. Um, so um, same idea there. That's what Open Distro did. Um, and it existed for quite a while. Um, is that the, the um, set of plugins that underlie the uh, Amazon's own service uh, that provided that. So um, that was there. Um, and that went on for a while. And this is what I was hired to work with. Well, something happened at the beginning of this year. Uh, open source. Elasticsearch and Kibana uh, had a license change. Now, up to this point, Elasticsearch and Kibana um, had um, in their repos uh, things in multiple licenses. So much of it was Apache 2.0 license, but then there was also other features that were under a proprietary license. Well, um, earlier this year, there was a license change on Elasticsearch and Kibana, so everything was under a proprietary license. Um, and depending on how you use it, two different proprietary licenses. Um, so um, that, that was really interesting. So no longer was there Apache 2.0 version. That, that 
there is no new Apache 2.0 version of Elasticsearch in Kibana. So that left uh, a really uh, interesting problem to solve. Um, practically, um, it left the open distro for Elasticsearch project without core, um, and that wasn't acceptable. And indeed, you know, Amazon's own uh, service without a, a, a core to work from as well. Um, not to mention everybody else in the um, entire um, community that surrounded this that were also left without a path forward. Um, so we decided um, that we were going to move forward and fork this um, into from taking the um, Apache 2.0 code of uh, Elasticsearch and Kibana and then um, moving that out um, as, a, as a fork to move it forward in the open source world. Um, then um, we also decided to take uh, open distro and effectively fork and then archive the existing, uh, um, that's the plan at least for open distro, um, is to have um, everything going forward to work with open search. And that's what this says. So open search is the kind of uh, combination of, uh, you know, the forked versions of Elasticsearch and Kibana, as well as uh, all these plugin tools that add rich features to it. So that's that's what open search really is, and that's the history. Um, so um, it, it's, it's a very uh, exciting project because as you can imagine, um, we hope that this will be, um, become something that people use all over the place. We already have a lot of industry support for it. Um, so it's really, uh, it, we really hope that this is the path forward for a number of people. Now the open search versus the open search project. I will uh, readily admit that there is some confusing terminology here that I want to cover. So um, open search can refer to multiple different things. Um, so let's look at this kind of grid. Um, so the GitHub repo is, Open search project, right? So, uh, open search project refers to. Um, I should actually say this is um, the. It should be repo here to the organization, uh, the GitHub organization rather than repo. Um, so, open search GitHub.com slash open search project is is the um, organization, and then there is a repo inside of that for open search, if that makes sense. Um, and then open search by itself, the most specific form of that would be the, the search daemon, the distributed search daemon. Um, so um, from a general uh, standpoint, if you see either one, they can refer, an open search project can refer to open search, open search dashboard, and then plugins, uh, as well as um, it could also refer to just saying uh, open search project could be the, that or open search. So it, it, it's, it, it's a little bit overloaded, um, Hopefully you can pay attention to the context and understand what it is. So if you do get involved with the project and someone says, are you talking about open search or the open search project? Um, you'd be able to understand what they're coming from. So what do you intend to use this for, right? Uh, there's two basic categories of use cases. There's kind of this idea of, of um, machine generated data. Um, so this is something um, directly or indirectly a machine generated data. So this is logs, metrics, and then trace things that you're using in an analytical form. Um, these uh, pieces are coming together generally. Um, this is something that's being admitted somewhere else and then being picked up and, and searched. So you can understand your architecture of your um, very complex systems. Um, the other category of use cases is enterprise or general search. Uh, and these, uh, fall into um, a more literal interpretation of search. Um, so as you can imagine, you could have things like, uh, you know, literal documents that you might have for your business or um, things that are catalog items in an e-commerce situation. These would be the general search workloads. Now, um, open search is intended for both of these workloads. They do seem a little bit different, but when you get down to them, they have the same requirements. Um, so it makes it a very interesting thing to build for two different audiences. From a perspective of, you know, volume, we know that the volume of the first category is much larger. So there's going to be a lot more data involved um, with, with analytical workloads as compared to search workloads. You know, even the largest search workloads are, are um, you know, oftentimes smaller and um, slower moving than, than log metrics and trace data. Um, so uh, again, um, Try to serve both, I would say the small proportion is the uh, general search workloads or enterprise search workloads. Something I've mentioned before and I want to dive a little deeper on is the license. Uh, 
the open search project is uh, at its core is, is a, a permissible license and we use a uh, Apache 2.0 uh, ALB2. Um, and this gives you all the rights that are really well understood by a lot of people in our industry to use, modify, extend, embed, monetize, resell, or make part of your own uh, product and or service. Um, so I just rattled those off, but it does give you a lot of freedoms. Um, and those freedoms can range from anything of, of a minor use. You're using a couple nodes of that. That's great. We, we applaud that to somebody that decides to run a service based on this and, and have, um, you know, thousands or potentially millions of other people, um, you know, uh, using uh, open search from your service. It's all allowed. And the other kind of important thing here is, um, is it looking at this and saying like, we're playing by our own rules here. Uh, at Amazon, we're not doing anything that would, uh, would be any different than anybody else when it comes to the license. So um, it really enables this. The, the other thing that I want to talk about as far as licensing is concerned is, um, you know, licensing is um, something where um, a lot of organizations have an allowable set of licenses. Um, and proprietary licenses may be completely not allowed um, uh, by policy, or they might be something that would require a legal review or something like that. Um, that that's not... Um, a great way to start a software project, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it, it's not an unusual perspective to think that uh, the people who are implementing or integrating the software should make choices on the software, um, not having to have, um, you know, uh, to get anybody involved as far as licensing or anything else. The Apache 2.0 license is widely used across the industry. Um, and uh, for most organizations, it's a very palatable license. Now, the other thing to mention here is that this extends to components throughout the system. So anything that you're going to use for the software is Apache 2.0. Um, so open search, open search dashboards, all the plugins, all the tools. Um, there's not a licensing model where we're trying to sell anything else. This is all available under Apache 2.0. The exception being the website itself, which is uh, BSD three clause, three clause license. So there's a long story behind that, um, but it, it's just the website, um, which is also open source. And, and if you want to uh, contribute to the website, I, we'd love it. So the status of the project is um, as follows. Uh, basically, um, in January, we made that announcement um, in reaction to the uh, license change. Uh, we took uh, a while to uh, release it. Um, it was released uh, in in April of 2021, um, and uh, you know, that seems like a pretty big lag, uh, but in, in reality, that was a very hectic time to get it there. There was a, a, every line had to be evaluated, and and um, to get Open Search and Open Search dashboards out there. Uh, by the time you're seeing this, Beta One should be out. Um, now, I am recording this prior to the release, um, so I will tell you that uh, there is a, a bit of a crystal ball that I have to to bring out and look into, um, but um, it should be out by that time. Um, and then we'll progress through beta two release candidate um, phases. And then uh, in summer of 2021, um, we'll have general availability. Now, what does all this mean uh, as far as these different alpha and beta and things like that? Um, you know, uh, the kind of way we're looking at this is uh, alpha uh, was a release out there. So we that's not feature complete and um, not tested. Beta is not tested, uh, but yet feature complete and release candidate should be feature complete, complete and um, for the most part um, uh, tested in the general availability would be thumbs up as best as the team knows it's ready for um, production use. So um, we're saying summer 2021 and, and um, it was pointed out to me that uh, that only applies in the northern hemisphere. Um, that would be winter in the summer, southern hemisphere. So uh, an alternate way of thinking of this is roughly the middle part of um, of 2021. So um, every anticipation that uh, it'll be out there for the middle of the year at some point. Um, like I said, I, I wish I could give you that it'll be out on uh, uh, you know month and day, but uh, we don't have that level of granularity. We are taking the time that it takes um, to get out there, and uh, from all of our best estimates. Uh, the summer 2021 will still hold. So I want to spend some time talking about the um, architecture and plugins that are uh, inside OpenSearch. And uh, this is a, an important part 
of this to understand all these different components that are involved here. Uh, the first place to start, obviously, is with the search daemon itself. It's, it's a distributed search daemon, meaning that, um, of course, uh, you're not limited to one machine or, or one instance or one virtualized machine. Um, you can take the data and the duties of uh, being a search engine and distribute it out to multiple different nodes. Uh, you don't interact with uh, OpenSearch directly. It's uh, interacted through a REST API. So when someone says, I clicked on something in OpenSearch, you know they're talking about something else. Um, and it's a, a pretty straightforward REST API. It's very extensive, but um, it follows the you know verb and path uh, format, um, putting that together into a URI and, and um, you know uh, able to um, put a JSON payload into it. And that's how you interact with it. Uh, it performs indexing and storage of data. Um, indexing is its primary uh, responsibility. Uh, storage of data, of course, is available. Um, I think when I put this in a presentation about indexing and storage, people think this is a database. Um, you can think of it like a database in many ways, and it, it has some, many of the similar marker, markers of a database, but you probably don't want to use it like you'd use a primary database, um, just based on its uh, guarantees and its transaction model. Uh, it is built in Java using Lucene. Um, Lucene is a long-standing, uh, well-regarded uh, search library. Uh, that powers a lot of the, the core functionality of, of OpenSearch. Uh, so um, we have members on our team that work directly with Lucene. So uh, this is um, something that it's not just powering OpenSearch, but it's powering uh, lots of different um, search implementations around the, uh, around the uh, software uh, world. Uh, it has various different types of nodes. Uh, it has data, and we have an unfortunate terminology here that we're deprecating eventually and moving to better terminology. We'll call the name nodes for this, the purpose of this um, this presentation. They may uh, take on a different uh, name as we go forward. We have coordinating nodes and then ingest nodes. Um, and those all play a different role. Um, OpenSearch dashboards is a browser-based UI and uh, visualization uh, platform for OpenSearch. Uh, it has built-in charts and table representations um, of, of data. So you can take those and, and not have to build those yourself. Um, so this really um, takes the data that might be kind of raw when it's coming out of OpenSearch and gives it a uh, much more human digestible um, uh, form. You can compose charts and tables into dashboards. Um, one of its primary uses, of course, is to get that at-a-glance view that a dashboard provides uh, when you want to kind of look at something and go, is everything going OK with my architecture? Is everything going away with the software that I'm running for my service? Um, it, this can be composed those that chart and data, uh, charts and tables into um, these dashboards that, that are so often requested. Uh, you can interact with OpenSearch uh, directly um, uh, or using DQL. Um, so this allows you to, to send Basically the same requests uh, that you'd be sending to OpenSearch, but in a more palatable UI, or using DQL, which simplifies the um, um, the um, the uh, DSL that that is uh, the query DSL that's available in OpenSearch. So DQL uh, gives it a little bit of a translation layer, um, and then uh, it's built in TypeScript um, and runs on Node.js as opposed to OpenSearch running in the JVM. So entirely different, and, and as a consequence, um, the teams are different. Um, different, you know, such a different way of, of building software. So um, it's an important thing if you're wanting to get involved, um, where you feel most comfortable. Uh, so if you're a JVM type of person, um, you go for the open uh, search world. If you're uh, in the Node.js world or JavaScript world, then head on over to dashboards to get involved. Let's go over the basic architecture uh, of a cluster. Um, so uh, Let's start inside the dotted line. Uh, that is the uh, the cluster itself. Um, so uh, the node March C, that's a coordinating node. Um, this takes um, requests from clients that come in. So that could be dashboards or um, you know some sort of application or, or ingester or something. Um, uh, and uh, basically um, allows you to uh, to the different uh, more specific nodes inside of that. So it, it's accepting things and uh, moving uh, the data around to, to, to the, the correct place. Uh, 
Um, and then uh, when data is coming back, it's actually taking the data that is um, in different forms and kind of combining it um, and sending it back to the client. So if you can think about this as kind of the, uh, the doorman um, of the, the cluster. Now, uh, marked M, let's call this the main node, for lack of a better term at the moment. Um, this manages you know, the overall operation of the cluster and keeping track of um, the cluster state. So um, make sure that um, you know, when nodes are coming and going, um, and the health of those nodes, it's keeping track of those uh, pieces. Um, and then it um, also does, has responsibility for creating and deleting indices. And then uh, managing shards as well. Um, it, so uh, that gets us to the data nodes, which actually um, does all the data operations. So that's things like indexing, searching, and aggregating uh, on those local shards. Um, so uh, this is the, the type of nodes that are really using disk, uh, disk intensive or um, you know, uh, infrastructure. So that's the basic architecture. Uh, if you see dash, that's short for dashboards. That's on the outside. Um, it, it is not part of the main cluster. Um, it's interacting with it just like any other um, piece of software, really. Um, so, um, and then you can see your software on the outside. So this is the basic architecture that you can see. Um, and uh, the important thing to know on this is that uh, um, this is all in open search and open search dashboards. For the next few slides, we're going to go into the individual plugins and how they work. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about security and access control. There is a security plugin um, that plugs into um, into Open Search and Open Search dashboards, uh, both, and um, this is uh, an important part of um, a distinction from from other similar software. Uh, this has a lot of implications for other uh, pieces throughout um, the other plugins. So if you think about a security model, it's hard to kind of design around a security model, or excuse me, design uh, without a security model in mind. So you have to kind of use this as one of the most um, central plugins in, in, in when you're building open search. It enables node-to-node -node encryption. So um, by default, without the security plugin, they'd be talking in clear text. It uh, is responsible for authentication, um, and there's a whole lot of ways that you can authenticate into this particular piece of software, um, a lot of integrations here, um, but um, it, it does provide um, a way to identify users and gives that concept um, to OpenSearch. Uh, it provides role-based access control, um, RBAC. Um, if you've ever uh, worked with this, it's a very handy way of organizing the permissions that you need to give to individual users. Uh, instead of each user having its own um, profile, you can then give roles to those users and those users can inherit the uh, permissions from the roles. Uh, very, very handy and a, a great way to, to manage access. Um, when we're talking about the actual access restrictions, uh, the data, it, it restricts the data layer on a number of different ways. So uh, going from uh, index, so each index can, can have users that are allowed to see it to the document in, and down to the field level access control. And personally, I think field level access control is incredibly interesting. Um, that it enables uh, different users to um, perceive the individual document down to the field level differently. Um, so this, this can, uh, underlie a lot of uh, things. So uh, a user gets least privilege based on down to the field. Um, and it's it's quite, um, there's quite a lot of knobs to turn when it comes to this. And of course, um, it provides the audit logging that you might need to understand how uh, everything's being accessed um, and also provides the underlying uh, multi-tenancy uh, to dashboards as well. So this is kind of that center um, and all the other plugins uh, in open search, do have to kind of comply with the security plugin uh, to work effectively. Now, one of the other um, most important um, user-facing uh, pieces in open search is the variety of query languages. We did touch on DQL. Um, that's slightly different um, than, than these because these are specifically uh, query languages that can be used um, without uh, having dashboards involved. Um, so. The query DSL is what it was inherited from the, 
the previous project. Um, this is if you've ever used, uh, it, you know, uh, this or think about how queries would work in this type of software. It's going to look a lot like this. Now, um, it is very powerful, uh, and there's a lot of options here. A lot of people find this to be a little bit challenging to use. Um, it is interesting to see how a query language can be put into JSON. Um, I, I say that because I actually kind of love its beauty of this this uh, PSL, but also I, I think that that I, I always get it wrong on the first try. Um, and I've been writing queries for a long time, various different query languages. So let's break this down. Now, the examples I'm going to give today, let's imagine that we have a list of uh, computers, and those computers have you know, a name field, and they have a RAM field, and maybe other fields as well. So, But in this case, we have um, you know, the name field is um, you know, the name of the machine, um, the brand name, um, and then you have the amount of RAM that's in it. This query would say, give me the names of the machines where the RAM uh, uh, property is greater than 16,000. So um, I do want you to pay attention to the number of nested uh, curly braces here and the number of uh, double quotes that you have here. It's incredibly easy to start writing this out and skip one of these, and then you, it's a little hard to debug. Um, but it's useful and powerful. So let's take a look at a different one that maybe is a little more familiar to you. OpenSearch has the ability and built-in uh, SQL implementation. Um, and this is so much more comfortable for a lot of folks um, that have uh, grown up using SQL uh, in their um, in their careers. Um, this is the same representation of the query that we did previously, um, but you can read it. Select name from computers where RAM is greater than 16,000, um, where it's not as readable before. Uh, we have ODBC drivers and JDBC drivers as well for our various inter integrations, um, and it works great. Now, uh, SQL is a very structured language, um, and um, I would say that greedy cell is maybe even more structured in, in a lot of ways. Um, there's a less structured option available in um, OpenSearch, and that's pipe processing language. Pipe processing language is a, um, a new query language that um, is available in, uh, it started in Open Distro for Elasticsearch, and now it's available in uh, OpenSearch. Um, but it's great because it's uh, something you can build iterative, iterative queries. Um, iteratively getting more precise. Um, so in this, let's take it from the uh, left-hand side, source equals computers. If I was to run that, that would be a valid PPL, pipe processing language query, and it would just return back uh, all the documents in the index computers. Now, uh, I'm going to provide a condition here uh, in a pipe. So this works a lot like piping um, information from one process to another in, say, Unix. Um, where RAM is greater than 16,000. And then I would um, then further limit that. And so if I was just to run this, it would give me all of the all of the properties of all the documents um, where uh, RAM is greater than 16,000. And then I'm going to pipe it again into um, this, um, this, this basic filter where I'm um, filtering just only the fields out of that. So I'm only getting the field property out of it. Now you can imagine um, as you start building multiple wares, uh, multiple fields, you can start really um, thinking about how you might really um, go deep into your queries without having to start to know where you're going, which you might have to with query DSL or, or SQL implementations. Uh, another important thing, uh, this is becomes mainly when we're talking about um, about uh, log data is alerting. Uh, this allows you to run a query on a schedule, like say a cron pattern, every n number of minutes, or uh, any other thing else you can express the cron pattern. You trigger an alert um, when a condition is met. So, for example, you'd have an aggregation. So, when n number of errors occur in a, in a single hour, and you wouldn't express it just like this, but um, that's the human readable version of it. Um, so, let's say when you have 10, um, you know. 503 errors in an hour, for example, um, then we're going to do something about that. So we'll take an action on that alert. Um, and so you would basically take that um, and, and formulate something that would be sent out as a, a Slack message, or fire a web hook, or send an email. Um, that sort of thing uh, would be the action that we take on. So as you can imagine, this is, is really great for situations where um, you know, you want to keep tabs on things and, and have human intervention. And, and because it's a web hook, it could even be a non-human intervention as well. 
Um, so super useful when, when running software. A similar um, and kind of related uh, piece is anomaly detection. So this is an unsupervised machine learning algorithm using random cut forest to, do, to find outliers in your data. So um, this is a great piece of information that when, for example, you're getting um, you know, uh, data that, that's kind of, you don't really know what's bad looking in it. Maybe you want to find where something looks a lot different. Um, that's what anomaly detection would be used for. To do this, you create a detector uh, where you define a timestamp and kind of a filter and an interval in which you run that detector. Um, and then you look at features that you want to look at that. So uh, what, what you're checking, right? So um, if you're saying a particular uh, field or something like that, that would be the feature that you're going to do. And then you, um, you know, have an aggregation feature on top of that. Um, you observe in dashboards the results, or you can also create an alert using the alerting plugin from the previous slide. Um, and uh, of course, you can always adjust the model as you might need, or um, you can uh, manage it over detectors over time. So you can add and remove and change what's being observed, that sort of thing. So super useful for um, a, a number of use cases and things like fraud detection, um, super useful for that. Uh, there's an index state management plugin um, for OpenSearch. Basically, this helps you manage indices based on their properties. Um, so um, in this case, maybe you want to say when it's reaches a size, um, you're going to do something uh, to an index. What that enables you to do is create uh, indices that have kind of a life cycle to them. Um, so you create these policies that perform actions uh, when a state is in a transition. So or when the state's in a transition. So for example, Let's say you have indices uh, on a pattern, and those indices um, you only want to make them read only after 30 days, um, or just even delete them when they get past a certain age. Um, this enables you to um, follow the idea that data is more useful when it's fresher. Uh, maybe you don't really need, uh, you know, millisecond precision data that you can actively uh, write to from six months ago. That, that's probably not very useful. And index type management kind of can underlie these, these type of use cases um, where you're um, kind of cycling these things through and, and then deleting all data when it's not needed. Notebooks are a way to create a narrative um, around visualizations and uh, paragraphs. So this is a plugin uh, for dashboards that enables you to take the, um, the information that's already there and then uh, present it in kind of a linear fashion. You take the visualization, so maps, charts, and data, um, and then you add paragraphs into those, and you arrange it in a linear fashion that tells a story. Um, now, this is not for like story time with your kids. What this is really for is like, um, for example, what happens when you have, um, you know, a correction of error that you need to make, um, and show what occurred in this this incident. Um, so you might want to give this to your boss, for example, um, and your boss. Uh, needs to have all the context to it. So you say, you know, here is where um, we saw, saw an accelerated error rate, and this is coming from, uh, you know, slow, slowness in our um, incoming um, incoming bandwidth, or, or limits in our incoming bandwidth. So you would write that out, and you show you the visualization, you write a paragraph, and you show some more visualizations, and you kind of create this story, and then um, you have a way to present this to somebody. Um, because oftentimes things like dashboards um, don't have the enough context or they're presented in a way that's very nonlinear. Reports is a uh, another plugin for dashboards. Uh, this is designed for sharing data and visualizations. This is basically getting your data out of dashboards and into a format that can be shared with others. So a PDF, PNG, or CSV file. Um, you can use the, this to create them at a, on demand, so you know uh, arbitrary times or on a schedule. So think about uh, you know having a, a schedule that comes out that your your boss is giving me this report every Monday morning. Uh, well, you can set up reports to generate the data while you're sleeping, and then you just have to take that and uh, that report that's generated and, and hand that over to your boss. Let's go into uh, async search. Um, async search is a super useful feature for long running queries. Most queries that you're running are probably going to be relatively fast, but of course, sometimes you have that query that, that is just a monster and it takes a long time, um, especially on large clusters, to get its, all its results back. 
Uh, so you're basically saying run the query in the background as opposed to running actively uh, in a connection. Um, so uh, like I mentioned earlier, using uh, open search uses a REST connection uh, to make that, and then it's HTTP and there's timeouts involved. So if you have a client disconnection, you don't want to have to go back and run that. Let's say you have a client dis disconnection when you're three or four minutes into it, that can be very painful. Um, instead, what it allows you to do is, um, you know, get the results back when they're done and not have to maintain that connection, or you can even get partial results back. Um, so as the data comes in, you can say, well, you know, let's, let's take a look at this is the right data that I'm pulling. Um, and you can kind of see the data coming in and, and make a judgment call. Uh, another plugin is the KNM plugin. Uh, this is a really interesting uh, plugin to find the nearest neighbors. So of a particular function, I, I like to think of recommendations as kind of the canonical use case for this, but can even be used for image recognition and fraud detection. Um, data becomes a representation as vectors, and then those vectors can be um, uh, basically plotted into a hierarchical, navigable, small world graph uh, to find the, um, the, the things that are most similar, right? So um, it's a kind of classical problem. So this could be using uh, you know, recommendations for uh, more kind of catalog type of, um, uh, of workloads, uh, but it can even be other things too. Um, so finding if, if, for example, in fraud medication or detection, if for example, does, is this something that looks like it's also being done somewhere else? Uh, and KNN will help you with that. Uh, Trace Analytics is one of the newer plugins for open search. Uh, it allows you to uh, visualize trace data across complex architectures. Um, now we've all seen things um, like, uh, like, uh, like microservices architectures and building microservices architectures is it's difficult sometimes, but th the real problem comes in running them and debugging them more specifically. And uh, Trace Analytics is a dashboards, uh, open search dashboards plugin that uh, enables you to uh, help understand what's happening. So uh, trace data is data that would uh, be able to help you follow uh, as things go through a complex architecture. So as it's going through, for example, a microservices architecture, where is the latency? Um, that sort of thing um, can be helped with trace data. Otherwise, that's really hard to see because you know you just have kind of these disconnected um, requests that are flying back and forth. It supports open telemetry, which is an open standard that's kind of emerging right now uh, for collecting this type of data. Um, and it's designed to work with data prepper, which is a, another kind of uh, uh, beta level component of uh, open search. And um, data prepper uh, basically brings in data um, from uh, various sources so you can bring this in all in the same format that's understandable by the open search and open search dashboards with the Tra trace analytics plugin. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about basic usage and interaction. I'm gonna go through a, a few small things here. Um, so bear with me. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you get um, open search uh, and then how you may do a few operations with it. So first let's set some um, expectations here. This is beta level software um, and the betas are being released on Docker uh, and um, as a uh, tarball uh, for Linux in the x86 architecture. Now, um, as we move to say uh, GA, more architectures will be available and as well as more OSs. This, the, the choice for uh, beta being Docker and Linux only does give us a um, uh, ability to kind of limit the, um, the surface area in which we have to uh, build for. Um, and so we can understand that. And then uh, release candidate and GA will be introducing more architectures and OSs. So um, we do plan on supporting more. All right, so now let's go into some demos. Let's go ahead and do a short demo of uh, OpenSearch. So the first thing we do is gonna interact directly with OpenSearch through the REST uh, API. So this is, we're gonna do a few simple things. Um, just to show you what's happening. So I'm just going to use curl, um, and then I'm just going to do a HTTP request to localhost because I have this running on my machine here. 9200 is the port it works at. Now, if you've used something like some of the predecessor uh, pieces of software, this might have worked, but um, you get an empty reply from the server. Uh, so one of the distinctions in OpenSearch is that there is built-in security. Um, so to deal with that, um, let's use HTTPS, HTTPS. Um, so localhost 9200, um, and then this is a demo cert on this machine. So uh, I'm using the dash case so we don't like try to validate it. Um, 
and I get it unauthorized. What's going on here? That's the other part of the security uh, that's built into it. There is a concept of usernames and passwords, and they work with a variety of different um, of um, ways of authenticating, but we're just going to use basic uh, auth. So um, I'm going to do the same thing again, uh, 9200 localhost, um, and then I'm going to add a user to it. I'm going to use the admin user. Uh, super secure password uh, and username, admin, admin, that's what it comes out of the box with, but of course you should really change it. Um, so when I do that, uh, we go over here and do dash K, uh, and we see this. Now this is an earlier version, so they'll probably be a little bit different. You see the snapshot and smoke test node. I am recording this before beta is out, so this is the alpha version, but it should be pretty darn close. Um, you know, not a whole lot interesting here, uh, but it is important to understand that uh, there is a few things that are different um, about this. So like the username and the HTTPS, um, let's take a look at using a different user. Um, so I went ahead and set up another user, a non-admin user. Um, so let's take a look at what this person can see. Um, localhost again, port 9200. Um, and then this time I'm gonna use user um, Kyle pass one, two, three, four. Um, and we do the dash K and we get this big, long piece of JSON. Well, what's going on here? Uh, basically it's saying, I don't have the permissions for that user. It, it is a valid user, um, but I don't have the permissions to, um, actually do anything with it. It's saying you don't have the ability to monitor the cluster and all sorts of things like that. So we're getting a 403 error. Now, if I was to go through and change the password to something that's invalid, um, you see we get an unauthorized like we did before. And if I was to change it to a user that doesn't exist, uh, Kyle X, we also get the unauthorized as well. Um, so let's take a look at uh, another uh, type of thing where we're gonna actually look at a document, something a little more interesting. Um, so uh, we're gonna go back to localhost 9200, and then we're gonna look in an index. Um, and this is just the name of my indexes and index. Uh, and then I'm gonna point to a specific doc um, and this, the doc ID for this one is doc123. Um, and again, we're gonna put our user in, admin, admin, dash K, and we can see uh, we got a document back on it. Uh, it's giving us a little bit of information about that. Um, you can see in it, uh, it's got this, uh, the payload here, which is uh, in underscore source, where it says, uh, you know, searching the search face, that happens to be my name on the forums, and then an address that I don't live at. Um, so something actually productive happening, even though we're just, referencing a document by its document ID. Um, so let's actually um, take a look at something in a different way. So we're gonna leave the, the command prompt and then we're gonna kind of go over um, into dashboards. So um, here I have the dev console and dashboards and it's except, excuse me, the dev tools uh, and dashboards and there's the console here. Um, so I'm gonna do very similar things. I am logged in as admin, so I will be getting um, all the um, privileges that would exist under that user. Um, so I'm gonna do underscore doc and then doc one, two, three, type that in. Uh, and if you notice, that's what we had here, um, but just a different way of doing it. Um, and we can see here, paying attention to the deprecation notice, that's just something that's uh, um, on this particular um, uh, alpha version. Uh, and you can see we got a nice uh, formatted version of it and you can see a little more information um, than you could before. So it's a really helpful way of doing it. We have all sorts of things in dashboards, but I'm just kind of giving you an idea of how you can interact with it. Um, and then of course, if we wanna do something that has something more complicated, we can also do um, a payload. Um, so we can do actual a query. So in this case, let's do um, post and index. Um, so uh, then we're gonna do a search. So our payload in this is going to be the, um, query DSL, and I'm not going to uh, type it all in myself because boy, that would be boring watching me try to match the uh, different curly braces in. Um, we run this, we're going to okay, go to the right place on this, and there we go. So we did a search for searching search face, and we found that document back out of it. Um, so you have all the things that you might expect here um, in a kind of a point and click fashion. Look at another tool, and that's um, Open Search CLI. Um, so uh, OpenSearch CLI is uh, an interesting tool um, that's built, uh, originally came from Open Distro for Elasticsearch. Um, and basically this tool allows you to interact from the command line um, more richly than you would otherwise. Now you didn't 
you notice that I probably wasn't putting payloads in with curl. It just gets really hard, right? Because um, you're already getting a pretty long, um, you know, uh, thing to type in the command line. And if you're like me, I, I prefer the command line to anything else. So um, I'm going to use uh, Open Search CLI uh, to make things a little easier on myself. Um, and it's a little, it's a uh, little program written in Go. Uh, that basically um, allows you to do some things that you do over and over again um, and abstracts things a little bit. Um, so um, I'm going to do this curl. So it's basically doing curl like we did before, um, but making it a little bit easier to use. So I have a profile set up called local, and uh, that profile basically has uh, a few different things in it. It has my endpoint in it. It has my, um, you know, a username and password into it, and you can set that up. Uh, through this, uh, through through adding uh, things into the command line, um, and uh, makes it uh, you know really easy to set that up. So I'm not typing these things in manually, leaving them in my history, uh, anything like that on the, on the terminal here. Um, so I'm going to do uh, get uh, and path, and then we're going to do an index and doc underscore doc doc one two three. And if I attack this correctly, um, yeah, and I did, you can see you basically executed the equivalent uh, of what I did over here. Um, but um, we had a few things that are nicer about it because we didn't have to put in, you know, just some simple things like the password or the endpoint. And what makes this really great is you can actually set these up where perhaps every user on their own terminals has uh, a uh, profile set up. And then you can just say, hey, um, your profile set up for you and the endpoints that you have access to uh, run this command, right? And you don't have to kind of tell people to interpolate in usernames or passwords or anything like that. Um, so this is just a really short um, introduction to a few things that Open Search can do. Okay, so let's talk about contribution and involvement. Um, this is an important part, and I think at this stage in our project, probably the most important thing is to get folks involved in contributing uh, to open search. Because we think that it's going to go forward and, um, you know, the people who are contributing now will hopefully build patterns of contributing uh, and will start making software that they really want to use. Now, uh, GitHub, like most open source projects, is where uh, most of this occurs. So if you look at the open search project, that's our organization. Um, and inside that, we have two pinned repos. We have open search and open search dashboard. So those are the two core components, but we'll have a whole lot of other repos underneath. Um, and those other repos contain, most of them are code repos. We do have a, a few non-code repos that talk about uh, migrations and things like that. Um, so the open search project uh, does have a kind of a unique feature that I, I, I want to point out to folks um, in that many features are split between two repos. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, open search uh, is uh, written in a JVM language, in Java in this case, um, and so all of the plugins will also be written in a JVM language. And by the way, we do have more languages represented in our plugins besides just Java, like Kotlin, and so on. Um, but um, the dashboards plugins, which there's actually significant code over there, um, are written in uh, TypeScript. So um, two different teams work on them, and as a consequence, uh, there is, uh, for the most part, a split um, so you'll see uh, a double um, repo for those. Now, um, let's talk about communication on the project and how that works. Um, OpenSearch.org is, is our website. Uh, please visit it. <laughs> um, this website contains links to our forums. Uh, we have an active discourse um, forum. Um, and um, the discourse forum is um, you know, where a lot of the kind of rich conversations go on about this. Um, it's great for long form communication and it, it, it has some advantages over GitHub for that sort of thing. Um, so there will be people who have opinion posts or help wanted posts or things like that um, that are not something we would easily have on GitHub. We have a blog and we'll be publishing news and events as well. Um, uh, the events section would tell you um, anything that's coming up um, that's going to talk a lot about open search. We have a community meetings that are, are bi-weekly, um, and, I, and I, I run these, and so uh, I do want to uh, really pump them up a little bit. Um, they are, uh, I think, somewhat unique. We're in a weird time right now with community for any um, 
open source project where you might have conferences and you might have uh, meetups and things like that in a typical year. We, of course, the world situation is not lending uh, itself to those yet. Uh, so we do have biweekly uh, meetings on Zoom. Um, they have a kind of split format where we're going to have presentations in those, but also what we're going to be uh, having is, um, and we still, we actually have these and continue having them, um, is a uh, open forum where people can talk to each other. So it's an open Zoom call where um, you can ask questions of the team, um, either at Amazon or elsewhere, um, or you can uh, ask questions of one another. And we've had some really great stuff come out of those. Um, and uh, it, it's, I think, a strength in the community uh, that we have these kind of community meetings on a, frequent, a, a relatively good frequency every two weeks. All right, well, thank you so much for uh, letting me uh, spend some time with you today talking about open search. Um, please keep in contact. I am always um, open to talking about open search. And, um, you know, again, uh, you know, find me on all these platforms. And if you find me on the uh, on our forums, I'm searching search face. Uh, I regret a little bit adopting such a, a, a fun name. Uh, but most of the time I'm okay with it. So again, thank you so much for your time and I hope to see you uh, in the project.